Welcome everyone. We're giving one more minute before we go ahead and start. Glad to have y'all join. Okay, I think it will be good for us to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Guled. I'm one of your chapter leaders here at the Atlanta chapter of OWASP. Um, before we go, before we jump into this great talk that we're going to have from Abraham's, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about OWASP, if this is the first time you're ever joining us. Uh, OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, we are a global nonprofit, not-for-profit organization that's focused on helping to improve all aspects of application security. Um, so the most famous is the top 10 that we maintain of common vulnerabilities you see in web applications, but also in a spectrum. We also have the top 10 for uh, serverless. We have the top 10 for IoT. We have many top 10s um, and many different resources, uh, be it different tools you can use, documentation, um, learning modules, uh, there's, there's a lot that OWASP does. Um, as the Atlanta chapter, we try to share these different resources and have great talks like this. Uh, so please join us again. Uh, the next month we'll be having it both in person and online. So be welcome to have you in both physically and online. Uh, so, all right, I'd like to go and just go ahead and start. Uh, Abraham, take it away. Hello, can everybody hear me fine? Yeah, is the, is the audio working? Can you type in there? Yeah, you can hear me? Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah, nobody types in the chat, but I'll believe you. Uh, so, um, welcome to, um, to this talk. Uh, it's going to be uh, very practical, so I hope you are caffeinated. So. Um, let's get started. So I'm the director of uh, 7A Security. So this, if you are interested in this talk, maybe uh, you might want to take a look at some of the public reports in, uh, in this website. So feel free, like if this talk is interesting to you, uh, there's some uh, free Pentest reports that you can download and, and read from there. Uh, yeah, and I basically work for um, uh, Q53 and version one did some course for e-learn security. Uh, I'm the OWASP WTF um, project leader, one of them, uh, which is an OWASP uh, flagship project. Uh, then there's some link for the presentations, and I have some some certificates if you're into that. So just took a few of those as well. So uh, yeah, there's some famous uh, pentest reports uh, for mobile apps. Right, um, we did, for example, a pen test about a, an app that was mandated in an entire country. So, Smart Sheriff, I, I'm not sure, can you see my mouse? Yes, so uh, Smart Sheriff uh, was a mobile app that was mandated in South Korea. This is the good Korea, not the, not the other one. Uh, and um, basically, um, this uh, this app, we like the human rights activists were concerned that maybe this is not secure or, or something. So we basically contested it twice, and these are the public reports for that. And other famous ones are the Chinese police and uh, government apps. So you can you can take a look at those as well. Uh, and there's other ones here as well. So it's all here in publication. So if you if you are interested, you can read all that. So. This talk is going to be very practical, right? I don't like uh, quote unquote uh, bullshit kind of talks. I like more kind of hands on practical example. This is how you hack it. This is how you fix it kind of talks. I, I think uh, a lot of people like 
that kind of style. So I'm going to roll with that. And if you are familiar with some of my old presentations, these will follow a similar format. So we're going to play a game. And this game is going to be called, what is the vulnerability? So the first one that types in the chat the correct answer uh, is going to get uh, a pass for the mobile course that we have. So I'll, get, I'll, I'll send you um, a pass for the first for the for the um, first day of Android. Okay. Sounds good. Deal. For free. No strings attached. So. Um, yeah, and this is um, a lifetime kind of gift, right? This is, uh, you will get all updates uh, for free uh, forever while you remain alive. Um, we will also send you a t-shirt. So, uh, yeah, so just try to be the first one that types it uh, on the, um, that types the answer on the chat, um, if you feel you know the answer. Um, yeah, and we will, Roll from there. So let's start with uh, sexy uh, denial of service attacks. So uh, the scenario was that it was a tracking library um, used by some mobile app. So does anybody know what this command does? Anybody? Now I'm looking at the chat for answers. If nobody knows, it's okay because we have a lot more questions. So, a few more seconds. Nobody? Okay, so this is basically um, SBD. Well, let's say this is a filter. Mm. that limit to 80, uh, not really. So what this is doing, don't worry, okay, there's going to be a lot more questions, but um, this is basically a Netcat uh, clone called SVD, it's just a different kind of uh, Netcat tool. And this is listening um, on port 80. And um, if any, um, if any client connects to this server listening on port 80, it's going to render the output of, of yes, right? And, and that part of the answer was correct, but what this command is doing is this. So basically, this is useful for denial of service testing because uh, if you can, like, let's say, DNS spoof and redirect traffic to somewhere else and then try to crash an app, uh, this can be a, a useful way to do it. So. Uh, you can see here uh, what the crash looked like. So there was a memory allocation problem, right? Because using uh, DNS spoofing, we could uh, redirect the traffic of the mobile app to some uh, server we control. And then this is the command that the server was running. So it would, like the app would run out of memory and it would crash, right? So just one way to do it. Um, and this is how it looked like on on the the actual like user interface. So normally it would be like uh, 50 megabytes, and when it crashed, it was like almost one gigabyte, right? Because it's just loading all the data it's getting. So this is the denial service. Now, how to fix this? Uh, consider using another library. Uh, implement adequate uh, exception handling. Try to have some general exception handler for unexpected errors. Right? This is something I always recommend. Like, no matter uh, how good you are as a developer, there's always going to be something uh, that you miss. Right? Like, there's always going to be unexpected conditions. So, try to have like a global kind of exception handler that is going to to catch all those things that that you didn't consider. Right? Now, uh, let's see some cool attacks using the SD card, right? So uh, if you are not familiar in Android, the SD card is kind of the wild west of security because 
uh, many apps can read and write from there. Um, if you have an Android phone and some thief steals the phone from you, they can normally just take out the SD card and read everything because it's normally not encrypted. And extracting the SD card from an Android phone doesn't even require you to, to know the analog pattern, right? So, uh, so yeah, no crypto. Uh, all apps can write, uh, read and write from anywhere and it can be extracted uh, without unlocking the phone, right? So for these reasons, uh, anything sensitive in the SD card uh, can be a problem. Um, so this is a scenario of saving sensitive stuff in the SD card. So here you have um, an app that was, um, this was for human rights activists. And this was basically an app that was uh, saving uh, human rights violation reports in the SD card in clear text, right? So now this is really bad because uh, the context was that this was in some country that was kind of an oppressive kind of regime, regime, right? And um, if let's say police catches you and you have uh, this kind of stuff in your SD card and please like take a look at the SD card and see this, then you can be in serious trouble. Like maybe somebody's killed, maybe they go to prison or some kind of uh, stuff like that. Right? So it can be, uh, it can be a problem. So yeah, and this is like a continuation of all the sensitive information here, uh, PII, right? Like uh, personally identifiable information, first name, last name, age, gender, marital status, address, you know. So, so yeah, pretty bad. Now, another thing is uh, loading uh, text files from the SD card. So, um, this this is another app, and it's interesting because it was using JavaScript. Um, to load data in a text file from the SD card, right? So, um, does anybody see what the vulnerability is here? This one is easier. Anybody? I give you a few more seconds. Cross save scripting, but where? Bugger, bugger overflow, no. <laughs> um, it is cross save scripting, so we have a correct answer from uh, Jason. Um, so Jason, I'm going to write you down. Um, you get a, a, a free pass to the course, okay? So afterwards, yeah, because here, we will have to know who is who afterwards because here by Nick, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, just send me an email, okay, Jason? Mm, okay. So yeah, there's, um, this is loading um, a text file from the SD card, right? And it's, the problem is it's, um, it's loading the page data and it's just concatenating it into the string with HTML tags. So yeah, you had cross-site scripting here and um, this is like the explanation, right? So the file is loaded from the SD card, it's stored in a variable and it's concatenating into HTML leading to XSS. So chapter.txt was loaded from the SD card. Then here we have page data and it loads all the data into a variable. So until here, there's no problem. And the problem is in the last line of the slide, you can see that the page data is appended between HTML tags. So this is always like a, a bad sign, right? So 
Mm, yeah. So with this, what can we do? We can uh, a very cool tool when you're trying to uh, demo some kind of XSS is hack vector because sometimes you need to encode the payload because otherwise it's going to break things. Like normally, if you find XSS, it's because everything is being concatenated together. So uh, any double quote or single quote might break other things and, and the payload might not work very well. So a trick uh, to get around that is uh, in hack vector, it has a lot of encoding tools. So one of them is evolved from uh, car code. So here, basically, you can put like any uh, any a JavaScript that you want, and it's going to do without any single or double quotes or anything, just evolve string from car code, and then the actual um, <clears throat> the actual encoding for each of the characters. So there's no single quotes, no double quotes, and uh, things work more smoothly. So this is a free website. You don't need to register or anything. And you can just use this hackvector.co.uk from a my friend Gareth Hayes. So yeah, this is how it looked like. So uh, the attacker um, put some payload in the text file in the SD card. Then the app is open and the actual code with the XSS runs. And then here uh, as, a, as a demo, we could see, we could see like, for example, we can load uh, the SQLite um, databases that the app has and forward them to an attacker, right? So this was really bad. So how to fix this? Uh, first of all, if you can avoid saving sensitive information in the SD card, there are better places in Android to do this, like for example, uh, the app storage that is outside of the SD card and is protected by Android permissions. So no other apps can read there then uh, avoid loading HTML from unsafe locations if possible. Uh, on, for example, anything from the SD card should be considered uh, hostile. And then of course, you should output and code uh, input before concatenating it into HTML. So if that string had been, if that variable had been escaped with JavaScript, then, then it would have not worked. Now, other tools that we have in Android to fix this kind of stuff is to disable JavaScript. Um, and if things must be in the SD card, other uh, tricks to do this would be to hash cached files and save the hashes in some uh, protected storage, right? So, so with this, you would have, let's say, the hashes in the protected storage while the file in the SD card, because it's bigger or whatever, um, will not be protected, but then you can check if the hash is the same before opening the file and see if you can trust it or not. And if it's unsafe, then you can download it from the server again. So that could uh, provide the, the um, protection as well and mitigate this. And then, encrypted files in the in the SD card, but then the, the decryption key should be in protected storage. So on Android, in more modern versions, we have the, um, similar to the iOS keychain, there's something called the Android key store. So you could use that to, to protect your secrets, right? So that's the, like the proper way to do it. Okay, so now let's take a look at the copy paste text. So uh, the scenario here is, was that it was a, an app um, for like doing some crypto, right? A crypto vault, let's say something like LastPass or um, LastPass were, you know, one of those kind of uh, tools or key pass, right? So that kind of app. Um, now, does anybody know what this is doing? Does somebody have some explanation about this HTML? I'll give you a few more seconds. Anybody?
so there's, there is an aspect of social engineering to this, but what is the HTML doing? Mm. I'm seeing some answers, but there's no no good answer. So you're not really reading the, the keychain here. Mm. No, the, the, okay. So, okay, there are no, no good answers. Um, there's going to be many more, so don't worry. Uh, so it's copying the text, but the, the attack is that with CSS, you can say this text of the page uh, can be selected and this other uh, text cannot. So what this HTML is doing is it's making um, some text uh, selectable while some other text is being uh, displayed on top, right? So, um, yeah, Laurie got it right, but I was already explaining, but don't worry, there's going to be more answers, more questions. Uh, so yeah, this is what it's doing. So the user sees some unselectable text, right? Let's say a fake tutorial or something. Uh, but then what you are actually copying is the, the payload, right? In this case, it's like a path traversal to override uh, some file of the app, right? So this is how it looked like. So this is the site on the left and you don't see the payload. You just see, just select all this text. The other, the other text, the actual payload uh, was, was not visible until you pasted it, right? And then what happens with mobile apps is that because the mobile app truncates the input because the display is small. So it tries to keep things pretty and stuff. So there's always ways to sneak around the payload, kind of the dodgy parts of it. Let's say like the dot dot slash sequences and stuff. You can probably put it at the beginning if, if what the um, app is going to display is the end or the other way around. You could play with this depending on how the app works, right? So, the attack is like the user sees text A, but they actually they are actually pasting text B on the on the app itself. So yeah, there is an aspect of social engineering to this, but the actual attack is that with CSS you can show some text, and then when the user copies it, then they will paste something else. Uh, I see a question here. Where is the data traversing tool? Where is it going to end up? So the, if I go back to the actual payload here, you can see this report was, is public, right? So this is why uh, I'm disclosing what the, the app was. Uh, so you can see dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, and then there's a path to the actual app storage, which in Android is known. So now in modern versions of iOS, this attack would not be possible because iOS had some kind of random stuff, but in Android still to, to this day, uh, on mod, even on modern Android versions, the, the app path is, uh, is known, right? So you, if you're attacking a, a specific app, you know um, what, this is, whoops, what this is going to look like. So what this is doing is it's saving data into the actual storage. So it's, mm, to give you a bit, a bit more context, right? The app had uh, an export log functionality. So using a, some fake tutorial, you could like fool a user to use this export log functionality. And then when they paste uh, the payload with this attack, and they hit OK, what they are going to do is overwrite, so the, the export log is going to overwrite the actual vault where all the passwords are. And this is going to be like, it's basically going to delete all the data of the user, 
because uh, it's going to export the log with the same path that the that the app had, right? So that's the that's the database. The database of the app itself, where all the passwords were. So that that was the tag. Uh, it depends on the export tags step. Yes, it depends on the export step, but to exploit it, you need you need the HTML because a user is not going to paste a payload. You need to you need to make it more plausible, right? Like they are copying something that looks harmless, and then when they are actually pasting, they actually pasting the payload because users probably won't like to paste like alert one or something like that. Although many will, but you know your chances will be higher with some CSS trick like this. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So here we have uh, a file overwrite uh, with path traversal. So this is yeah, this is a bit more background of the same attack. So the user overrides the vault database where all the passwords are. The entire contents are no longer accessible. The data is deleted forever and the app crashes. So it will say log export successfully. Unfortunately, uh, the app has stopped and then you don't have any keys, right? So yeah, that was this attack. So now how to fix this, right? So make sure users have an option to see the entire paste text and not just the beginning or the end. So if the input is very big, consider maybe it's ugly to show a huge string, but Maybe you could add like a scroll bar so the user is kind of alerted something's funny or something is, is very long. Uh, and yeah, this is a common problem in mobile apps because of the small screen, uh, there's always like some data rendering truncation for so that things are pretty, right? Then uh, if you're expecting a file from the user, get the file, right? Get the file name and not not any path. So normally, uh, for example, um, in PHP and in other languages, you have some function called base name or similar that is going to um, ignore all the part, all the parts of a string, and only only take the actual file name while ignoring any slashes and dot dot slashes and things like this. So, uh, so yeah, get the base name, and then uh, you should also reject paths that contain any dot dot sequence. Uh, now, a common bug here is to think that if you replace dot dot slash with an empty string, that is going to work. But then you can put like several sequences of that, um, so there's tricks around that. So that's not good. But if you reject any path that contains two dots, then you should be you should be good to go. And then another thing is to resolve the path and verify that the path starts with the expected location after all your concatenations, right? So let's say the user gives you a string, and then um, you resolve the path. You get the base name, and you do all this, all these things. And at the end, you check, okay. Does the final string before I actually open it, does it actually start with what I expect this to start with? So it is, for example, the output directory of the logs, right? Uh, and yeah, so this is why the traversal was needed, right? So you can see here dot dot slash and all this because the logs were actually exported into the SD card and we have to tra traverse outside of the SD card into the app storage. So it's a path traversal, but the actual uh, proof of concept here, the interesting part of it was the, the CSS trick. So, okay, now let's look at uh, spoofing attacks. So with a spoofing attack, we're basically doing something a bit similar to this. So we're going to show one URL, but the click goes somewhere else, right? So uh, there's a technique uh, called left, uh, right to left and left to right uh, characters. So sometimes 
if you add these uh, sequences, these uh, these characters, like it will invert the actual payload, right? So the victim, for example, sees like grow.life.com, but the victim actually navigates to mog.evil.org, right? Because we changed the the order of the of the thing right with the with this trick with these uh, with these characters right to left and left to right sometimes still works it's an old technique but sometimes still works so this can be useful against email apps or chat apps especially apps that uh, let's say you send something that looks like a url and the app is going to to make it a link because it looks like a domain, for example, so it go, it's going to, to create a link for it. Uh, yeah, and this is a link uh, from Brian Krebs about that. Uh, now let's look at uh, content providers, right? So the scenario was a browser app with a custom URL handler. And here we have uh, adding fake news uh, with a content provider, right? So we have a, a news app and there's a string URL. We have content, it's a content provider. So the URL starts with content, slash some vulnerable app and best articles and then, and then a star, right? So uh, yeah, and then we can add like all the parameters, like the title of the news, the content, category, anything else we want. And then we can do uh, insert on this content provider uh, best article of these values. So the scenario here is if you had uh, a malicious app on the phone, it could uh, send a, an intent to this victim app and which was a news app and it would make this app render any like arbitrary news that you want right so the malicious app could inject like fake news on the news app which was pretty cool so yeah this is this is how it looked like uh so people are doing a bit better now with this uh, but still happens. So in general, this is a little bit like network security with mobile security, right? Like you want to keep your attack surface as as small as possible. So with network security, you try to have as few open ports as possible. Uh, with a web application, you try to have as few screens and as few uh, user input fields as possible on the website. Uh, only whatever is required for the app to work and you try to reduce the attack surface. So uh, on mobile apps, it's the same thing. In the Android manifest, uh, you declare what is exported and what is not. And in iOS, it's, it's similar as well. Uh, you can also define, like if you export a URL handler or you don't, if you have deep links or you, not, or you don't, and how uh, how much functionality do you export with these uh, deep links and stuff, right? But it's the same concept. So uh, if you don't need to export a content provider uh, to third-party apps, then just don't do it. And then if you must export it, then try to protect it with a permission, right? Like normally, if, if some functionality like this is exported for other apps to invoke it, uh, it would be uh, apps written by the same developer, right? So in Android, you can specify a permission that would, would only allow other apps signed by the same developer to invoke this content provider, right? So this would be like another approach to mitigate this. Um, yeah, so now let's look at local servers, right? So when you think about mobile applications, you don't really think about having a server on your phone, right? But some apps do this. So uh, the scenario was uh, Cordova uh, iOS app. So Cordova is basically a framework that allows you to write mobile apps with JavaScript. So uh, it was a Cordova iOS app and it used a 
plugin that connects to a local server, right? So uh, this is a path traversal without authentication, uh, showing the contents of Etsy password on the phone. So you could uh, basically invoke like local host and any like dot dot slash sequence, uh, and you could like browse the contents of of the files that the app had, which was pretty cool, without like authenticating or anything. So any like local app on the phone uh, would be able to do this because you just connect to the phone and to this port where the where the local server is, and you are able to to query anything, any file you wanted without authentication or anything, right? So this was also quite nice. So here uh, we can see using this from a browser on the phone. So show it the password and then uh, list files at the app level. So we could basically like browse uh, all the files that the that the app had, and these are the contents of Etsy password. So yeah, and then you can of course weaponize it a little bit. So using these commands. <clears throat> so any uh, data files, and then just do wget, and then you can like dump uh, all the files. So for example, you can do like you you could do like library caches, blah 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 and compile uh, cache data or any other like local file that the app had. And we could like dump it like that. So how to fix this? Uh, in this case, um, do not implement local servers and the, uh, unless you uh, really need them. Uh, and then if you need to do this, then at least require authentication, right? Like, so if something, if some other app is connecting to the local server and it can like request any URL it wants. At least to talk to the server, there should be some uh, minimum, some basic authentication or, or something, right? Like the the like arbitrary third-party apps should not be able to connect. And then another thing you can do is validate the URL with appropriate uh, access control and path traversal mitigation. Now let's look at URL, URL uh, schema tags. So we have a browser app with a custom URL handler, which is uh, an interesting attack surface. So here we have another question. Does anybody know what the vulnerability is? Giving you a few more seconds. Nobody? No XSS here? Any other guesses? So we have an app that is a browser, okay? Okay, that's, I think that's enough time. And we were talking about custom URL handlers. Uh, it's not a URL tree direction. What we could do here was actually close the, the browser. So this was, this is another uh, public report. So. This was the Onion browser, one of the first versions. And basically it had a custom URL handler that you could uh, invoke. So let's say uh, the Onion browser, what, why would you use it? You'd want to, uh, to have your own privacy and stuff, right? So you're visiting potentially hostile websites and you don't want them to know the IP that you're connecting from. Uh, but also the the website that you're visiting should not be able to close the browser, right? So in here you can see uh, that if, well, let's see in the next slide, I think it's going to be more highlighted. Yeah, so here 
is the same code as before, but here with the highlighting it makes it easier to understand, I think. So basically, the malicious space that this browser is visiting, you could have like image source onion browser for squid. And then this is going to match um, this is going to match this rule, right? So it has uh, self request, uh, absolute string, and range of string for squid is different than not found, then it will just quit. So let's say you're visiting a website and this website has this uh, HTML here, onion browser for squid, and it will quit the app. So the, any malicious website that you visit with this uh, browser app was able to invoke uh, functionality in the app itself from the website, right? So it, it was able, for example, to close the app. And it was also able to do other things in the app as well as close it. But this is just a simple uh, example. So uh, when you have custom uh, URL schemes, uh, this is one of the things that can happen is that the, the functionality in the custom URL handler may be used by any uh, malicious third party website that the app is using. Now, nowadays you should not use uh, custom URL handlers anymore. You should use deep links instead and there's like safe ways uh, to do this, but I'm getting uh, ahead of myself. So at the minimum, prompt the user before quitting. Okay, so that's always good practice if before taking some action in the, in the app, try to have some kind of manual step that the user must click something before actually quitting. Uh, if possible, eliminate this kind of force quit functionality and then implement a separate uh, screen flow for the help area, which websites cannot uh, invoke, for example, right? So uh, in general, consider universal links as custom URLs can be hijacked and are insecure because the other problem with custom URLs in iOS um, was the hijacking problem, right? Like if you have, you could have like a malicious app that registers the same custom URL, and then there were no actual good rules in iOS to determine which of the two apps should be able to, to use this, um, this custom URL, right? So there was kind of, uh, a race, right? Like which app was installed first or something. So, uh, yeah, in, because of this, you should use universal links instead nowadays, right? Nowadays, this is like considered the secure way to do this. Okay. So sexy logic bugs, right? The logic bugs, in my opinion, are the future of, um, of security because you can mitigate a lot of the traditional attacks, like with SQL injection, you have bind variables, with XSS, now we have a lot of scaping libraries. In .NET, you have razor views. And uh, in React, for example, you have, uh, you have to shoot yourself in the foot, like try really hard, like by assigning the malicious input to something called like dangerously set, uh, insecurely uh, HTML, something like this. Right, so, but logic bugs, like the developer has to remember to have an if there, right? Like, like no framework is going to save you from logic bugs because these are normally subtle issues, right? I can user A see data for user B, for example. So this is kind of stuff that normally frameworks are going to have a tough time uh, protecting the developer from, right? So. Uh, these kind of bugs are almost always missed by automated tools. Uh, sometimes they are actually quite hard to find. So uh, we have here a scenario, right? So we have, uh, this is the setting screen and this is the code. Does anybody see a problem with this? So this is the, what is the vulnerability to get a, a other than not checking for null. Uh, it is 
going to enable It's it's close. Frank and Lori are close, but it's it's not exactly that. But you are you are thinking in the right direction. You're thinking you almost have it, but that was not the exact problem. Uh, no, no harmful images. So basically, in here, uh, let me move on to the, there's going to be a lot more, so don't worry. Uh, so in here we have set JavaScript enabled, and then it's getting from the preferences, you can see here it's getting a uh, get string, and then this is like the default, right? So it's web view, get settings, set JavaScript enabled, so it's enabling JavaScript, uh, and then it tries to get the value from the preferences, right? Prefs is for the preferences, but then if the value is not there, it's going to default to true, right? So this is the actual issue that is defaulting to true when it has not been set yet, right? So the first time that the user has is using the app, uh, and and this is unticked, you would think JavaScript should not work. But let me see here the chat. No, no, it it enabled, so it's only the first time, right? So the problem here is the first time that you open the app, JavaScript is unticked in the preferences, but it's going to be enabled because it has not been, set. this property has not been set yet. It's a logic, it's a very subtle logic bug. But if you enable JavaScript and then you disabled it, then it was working fine because as you can see here, it was close. Okay, Lori, you have, if you are closer on another one, uh, I'll give you the pass as well. You were close, but it was not exactly regardless of user input. It was only the first time, right? Only because this is the problem, right? It's getting the, the Boolean value from the preferences. And the first time you use the app, you have not set the preferences yet. The, the preferences were not set yet. So if this fails to return something, the problem is here. It's, set, it's setting it to true, but this true is only going to happen if the value is not set. So if you, the first time you use the app, you would see JavaScript unticked, and then it would work with JavaScript enabled, right? So this was the bug, that the first time you use the app, without touching the settings, you look at the settings, you see JavaScript is disabled, but it was actually enabled. However, if you enable JavaScript and then disabled it, that would set the preference. So this would no longer work because now the preference is set, so it would not fall into true, it would fall into whatever you set. If it was enabled, enabled, if it was disabled, disabled. So the issue was only for the first time that you used the app. Uh, so yeah, it's a very subtle bug, right? Because all the functionality was correct. It was just because on the initial preferences file that they had, this preference was not set. So the first time you would see JavaScript disabled that it was actually enabled. Okay. So yeah, you could like basically uh, run any JavaScript you want, uh, launch alerts, and and yeah, and execute JavaScript. So how to fix this? Uh, this is interesting with the chat. <laughs> this is something we would not see on Ruby on Rails. 
Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but um, Ruby and Rails or any other languages, you would have different kind of uh, logic bugs, right? This is just one example. But the problem is with this kind of approach, like I've seen this, um, yeah, maybe on Rails is not as frequent, but in PHP, Java, uh, and a lot of other frameworks, it's kind of common to have some framework where you try to read something, and then if that fails, then return something, right? So you can see like as a developer, this can actually be quite handy because you have like a lot less code. You don't have code to check, hey, get the preference. And then if the preference is not set, then return this, right? So you would have like an if check and then whatever, then do something else. So that's messier. And this is kind of, prettier for a developer, right? Because you're getting the preference and then if nothing is said, then return true. So this is the problem uh, as when you did uh, your CISSP for those of you who did of fail safe and fail uh, unsafe, right? So you want to fail safe. You want to have like secure defaults. Like if something, uh, if you want, if you are setting set JavaScript enabled and the preference is not set, then this should be false, right? So if the preference is not set, disable it. And then if the user explicitly enables it, then, then it will be enabled. But the problem here, it is failing, uh, it's, it's defaulting to the insecure, right? So if it defaulted to the secure, then yeah, then that would, that would work. Uh, then another thing, ensure preferences are set in the preference file. So this behavior was because the initial preference file was missing this actual preference. So this is why it default to true and then default to the most secure setting instead. So instead of defaulting to true, it should default to, to false. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Uh, URL validation. Uh, so another one, what is the vulnerability here for URL validation? Any guesses? Well, well, while you think about the vulnerability, I'm going to answer a question here in the chat. So most sites today is broken without JavaScript. So aren't most JavaScript enabled, right? Yes, the normal thing is to enable JavaScript uh, by default and everything. But in this case, this was supposed to be a secure browser. And when you open the settings by default, you would see JavaScript is disabled. So a user looking at the preferences, seeing that, and then navigating the internet would feel like JavaScript was disabled. So, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was that. Uh, okay, let's see some guesses here. Okay, that's it. This is uh, the answer. Wait, you're typing too fast. <laughs> uh, give me a second to go through the answers. It's not about the SSL. It's not about the SSL validation. Uh, I think Frank was the first to say if any part of the URL has onion, right? Yeah, that is the issue. So Frank, I'm going to write you down as a winner. Okay. So this is the, <laughs> Frank is a beast, yes. 
So, uh, yeah, so basically it's checking if, well, let me show you in the other slide, which is highlighted, so it's going to make things easier. So it's checking if, this is actually tricky, right? Because to exploit it, we had to, um, to set up a, a, a subdomain I'm going to show now. So it's checking if the host contains onion somewhere, right? So if it contains onion somewhere, then uh, it will ignore uh, it will ignore the the certificate. So okay, let me go through the answers. But yeah, this is um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Frank got it right first. Yeah, sorry, I was just double checking. Uh, yeah, so if the domain, uh, what the, what it is trying to do is, if it is an onion server, disable SSL, right? If it contains onion somewhere. So uh, what we did was uh, create a subdomain. So you can create, for example, paypal.com.onion, something else and then point it to a, a Google IP address. And then when you visited uh, this site on a normal browser, you would get security warnings. Um, but when you visited this uh, using the Onion browser, that you, you would get no warnings, right? So this is a, a, a very common uh, logic bug, right? When, uh, when a substring is found anywhere, so normally, like if you're doing code reviews, right? Like you should look very carefully at code that is doing like string contains or this string is part of this string, this kind of compare uh, security checks like that are normally prone to, to this kind of bug, right? Because it contains what you're looking for, it's just not at the end, right? So if you expect the string to be at the end or at the beginning, so you should validate exactly that, like how the URL starts, how the URL finishes, not that it com just contains onion somewhere, right? So this was the this was the issue. So yeah, this is the how to fix this. So check if the host name ends with onion. Uh, verify that the that onion domain is actually running an onion server. So those would be uh, two ways. To, to do this. So let's move on to uh, man in the middle attacks, right? So the context here is a secure messenger app. Um, and we could have a clear text XMPP man in the middle. So it's a chat application, so it's using the XMPP protocol, which is a protocol for uh, this kind of chat stuff. So Java, for example, is going to use uh, XMPP and other, uh, other chat platforms as well. So in the handshake, it's a bit funny because like it should be like all over SSL, but the way it works is actually first using clear text and there's kind of a handshake over this clear text and you can if you are if you have money in the middle right you can set the handshake so that the only mechanism to authenticate is plain text so mechanism plain means the only way you can log in is sending your credentials over clear text so this is the first step right so the attacker manipulates the clear text xmpp response from the server and it's, it forces like uh, clear text is the only possible way to authenticate to this server. Then the mobile app says, okay, if it's the only way, then let's roll with that. And then it sends the credentials in clear text and you could see uh, if you base 64 decode this, you can see here uh, what the credentials are in, in plain text. So, uh, enforce TLS connections, uh, and if uh, TLS is unavailable, then refuse to connect, don't allow clear text fallback. So this will be the, the way to fix this. So update check mechanism. 
Now, this is another interesting vector, right? Because if you can control how an app updates, you can possibly execute some malicious code depending on how that's implemented, right? If it's done insecurely. So does anybody see a problem with this? And this one is quite easy. Anybody sees a problem here? To request an update like that? Felipe needs to spell things a bit better. Yeah, so I think I think Felipe was first. I think he meant it needs to enable HTTPS. Okay, so I'm going to write Felipe. I think in my chat you are first. Yeah. Um, let me write this down, Felipe. Okay. So yeah so this one uh, as i said uh, it was easy it's just the fact that the request that the app is sending starts with http so uh, and then it would request an update and then the server would say not found but of course if it's done over clear text http uh, you can have like any like you can spoof that right like it, without even being a government uh, able to forge a certificate or anything, you can just, uh, like anybody can with, a, with money in the middle can just spoof the response. And then instead of the normal response that we were getting not found, so there was no new update, we would say, yeah, yeah, there's this update and the URL to get this update is this telephone number, right? So, and this is interesting because on a mobile phone, on a mobile app, right, is the attack vectors are not just the um, uh, are not just the like SQL injection, XSS, and all the traditional web vectors, but also, for example, ringing premium phone numbers, right? Because there's phone numbers that if you ring, uh, the attacker is going to make money, uh, and it's going to cost a lot of money to somebody that is ringing, right? So that's another possible attack vector that is not as common. Uh, on a traditional kind of website pen test, right? So here we would have, these are a couple of screenshots from the app. So the app would say, hey, there's a new version. And then if you click on update, then it starts to call the, the number that the attacker chose, right? So let me see here the problem. Yeah, for for no or no update, uh, maybe wrong status code. I'm not really sure, but the main issue here is is that the the update was being requested over clear text HTTP, so anybody can spoof that. So even if the code was right or, or not, uh, you could still be able to do this attack. So that's the main thing. Then yeah, of course, probably things can be done a lot better, but. Uh, but let's focus on the on the actual attacks, right? So, so yeah, this is an interesting vector, right? So it it will show that there's an update, and then you click on update, and then you ring a phone number. So this was pretty cool. Uh, so how to fix this? Check your updates over TLS. Then consider pinning, right? Because there's been quite a few problems with certificate authorities. Some got hacked. Uh, others like the Hong Kong Post Office or other kind of certificate authorities trusted by default on most devices you might not want to trust so much. Uh, so in mobile apps, you can implement pinning to make sure that the connections you're establishing uh, to a third party website are actually the website that you're intending to, to connect to. Um, then of course, 
if you're trying to request an update, the URLs should look uh, like a like a URL, not like a phone number, right? It should not be a phone number URL. It should be like the URL to download the update, right? So you should check like if the URL that you are getting to download the update actually makes sense. Like it's not just a phone number, it's actually like a, a URL that looks like the kind of uh, URL you would use to download an update. Then verify that the update URL matches some trusted domains, uh, sign and verify uh, the signature of update checks. So another thing you should do with updates is, uh, let's say you, you ask the server, hey, is there an update? And then the server says, yes, this is the update, and this is the signature and of the update, and uh, this response has actually been signed with um, with the private key of the server, and then with the public key of the server, you can validate, for example, on the app that this is actually uh, a legitimate, uh, like signed, you know, signed response from the server. Uh, and the same with the update itself, you can like sign the updates and then the the app can verify that the signature is correct and then only then if the signatures and everything is fine, then you would update, right? Um, let me check the chat. Yeah, so I'd use a whitelist, of course. Uh, using a whitelist of, of URL domains would also be good. So, Let's move on. Now, third-party zip file retrieval, right? Like zip files, uh, now the Pinterest is among you are probably excited. So, what is the vulnerability? Does anybody see a problem here? Now the guys who already guessed give the others a chance. Does anybody see a problem here? the file we have TLS. Correct, so Mitesh Shah, so I'm going to write it down. Mitesh, Mitesh you got it right. Uh, yeah, so what happens is this, right? So on iOS, since iOS 9, uh, there is something called app tra transport security. So by default, apps are only allowed to make HTTP connections over TLS, right? So they are not allowed to use clear text HTTP communications anymore. Uh, now, a lot of developers complained about this when it happened, but but it's just the norm since iOS 9, right? And it actually makes sense, right, to communicate securely to third-party servers. So if the developer needs the app to make a clear text HTTP request somewhere for something, it must specify in the info peel list of the app, it must specify to which domains the app is allowed to make clear text HTTP connect connections, right? So in this case, it's, it was downloaded from some Amazon AWS, right? So from some S3 domain, it was downloading stuff over clear text HTTP and you would see that in the actual uh, info P list of the app, which is one of the files that you should review the first on iOS. 
So at runtime, right, without looking at the code or the configuration, uh, the app was basically downloading a zip file over ClearText HTTP. So this allows the attacker to replace the zip file and because the zip file then, of course, is uncompressed by the app uh, without any signature checks or anything either, um, the attacker uh, could like override uh, arbitrary app files. So you could have, let's say, the, the, with the zip file in the, the file names of the zip file can contain like dot dot slash sequence, for example, and you can like traverse app and override all the files, or if you know uh, the location, so the file names of the app, you can like overwrite uh, selective files with your own custom files. So you would, you, you were able to influence um, the local data files of the app, right? Which is something that should like never happen. So uh, how to fix this? Uh, avoid weakening uh, app transport security. Uh, and use dependencies that use secure TLS communications. Okay, so because in this case, like the vulnerability was not in the app itself, it was in one of the dependencies that was downloading uh, this zip file over ktext HTTP. So this is why. Now, another scenario, a user dialogue for SSL warnings. Okay, so uh, the first part, SSL exceptions trigger user interaction. Okay, you have to pay uh, to pay attention to this for the question that I'm going to ask later. So, SSL exceptions trigger user interaction. So you have cat certificate exception, and then uh, ask user, right? So this is like a simplified simplified uh, code, right? So this is the warning dialog, accept unknown certificate, uh, always once or abort, okay? And then uh, the user registers uh, a broadcast receiver. So the app is registering uh, a broadcast receiver to receive the, the answer to this dialog box, right? So, Let's say there's a, there's an SSL exception, so this call this code fires, and then the user is prompted. This is the prompt, and then to process this prompt, like did the user click on abort? Did they click on once, or did they click on always? To handle that, uh, the way the app is doing this is with a um, with a broadcast receiver, right? So it's setting a uh, registering a receiver. Uh, and then it starts the activity, and then at the at the end of processing the response, it unregisters the the receiver, right? So the user answer processes this intent, right? So it's getting the intent extra, the decision ID, the decision choice, and then uh, it stores. Uh, it stores the certificate in the chain, right? So let's say the user is using the app, then they get this warning. Then the broadcast receiver is registered. And then uh, if the user, let's say, clicked uh, always, always trust this, this SSL certificate, then it stores this certificate forever. And there will not be like any warnings anymore for this kind of certificate, right? So this kind of a simplified way to explain it, right? So what is the problem with this? Does anybody know? I'll explain it again, and then I'll check. Uh, it's not it's not a root certificate, okay? It's um, it's a normal certificate. So I'm going to explain it again and then I'll check the chat. So we have SSL exceptions, right? So you're using an app and then the SSL certificate of 
or whatever you're visiting is wrong, right? So then this will prompt the user. So when the user is prompted, they see this, right? And then the way the app is going to handle the response of this dialogue is with a broadcast receiver, right? So it registers a broadcast receiver, and then this is going to like be waiting until the user clicks on something, and then it will unregister the receiver, right? And this is the actual code that is processing uh, this dialog, right? So it gets uh, what was the decision ID, what was the choice, and then if the user clicked on allow always, it stores the certificate. So let me see the chat. Um, it does not install the root cert and there's no CA hijacking. No, no, wait, we just testing one app, okay? Okay, no, no good answer, but don't worry. Race condition, there's some, as, some aspect to race condition, but that is not the problem. So I'm going to, to explain the solution and then there'll be a few more questions, I think. So uh, this is uh, permanent. So this issue was a permanent man in the middle prompt bypass, right? Because you should never <laughs> Uh, register a broadcast receiver in Android for processing uh, the the input of a dialog form because a broadcast receiver is going will receive intents from any app on the phone, right? So you can send an intent, for example, with uh, this command ADB shell. So whenever the prompt is is present, or you can like keep sending the broadcast. Right, you can keep sending the broadcast to accept decision ID one, decision choice three, to accept always, and then so a malicious app installed on the phone can make like running in the background while you're using the other app can like ignore all SSL warnings without without like any user interaction whatsoever. So the user would get the, the dialog, but then the malicious app running in the background would be able to send a, a broadcast, um, an intent to the broadcast receiver, accepting the certificate forever. And then each time any SSL error would be found, then it would be, it would be safe, right? So the, the certificate would be safe. So uh, how to fix this? Instead of using a, a broadcast receiver, you should use a local broadcast receiver. So a local broadcast receiver can only receive uh, messages or intents from uh, the app itself and not from any other app installed on the phone, right? So for doing this kind of functionality, a local broadcast, uh, a, a local broadcast manager would make a lot more sense than, a, than the global uh, broadcast receiver, right? Now, if you really need a, a broadcast receiver, then protect it with a permission. And if you must use the broadcast receiver, consider making the decision ID an unpredictable random token instead of a sequential ID, right? So that would be like another solution. Uh, yeah, so... This is actually not a very good way to handle user input from a dialog using like a broadcast receiver because what the app really wanted was to process the input for, for the user that is using the app, not to process like an intent sent from any other app installed on the phone, right? Okay, so another scenario, another man in the middle of XMPP, we saw Another one before. Um, this is different. So we have a victim computer, this XS, uh, XMPP. 
there's the start, uh, start TLS and then there's XMPP over SSL, right? So this was the, the attack, right? So man in the middle of XMPP uh, SSL without warnings. So DNS spoof, right? So the first step, you, you're running like your attacker machine, kind of pen tester machine, and then you run a tool like, for example, DNS Chef, and you point like all, mm, all domains that are being queried, you point them to an attacker IP, right? Now, uh, a tool that works well for this is Prosody because it's like uh, very lightweight, lightweight and very simple. So you can, you can go to, to prosody.im and then the configuration is quite easy. So virtual host and you can have chat.facebook.com, you can have Gmail, Java, so any XMPP, right? So just add a virtual host entry for each uh, domain you wish Prosody to serve and then settings under each virtual host apply only to that host. So by default, it will use a self-signed certificate. So yeah, so this was, this is the, the end of it. So, so yeah, it works with the default uh, self-signed certificate. We could like mine in the middle fine, right? So, okay, let's move on to another one. Clear text HTTP communications on Android. So does anybody see a problem with this? Okay, you got it right, Frank. But you you already got uh, <laughs> you already got the the pass. So okay, give the others a chance. Uh, but yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, this was this was very easy, and we did another one like this before. I think there's a few more. So if uh, if you fail, if you if you didn't get it yet, don't worry. So yeah, the app gets the XML from the server over KTX HTTP, and then the file is saved to, um, it's saved like so, right? So you have to download file name, and the file name is retrieved from XML, and then the contents are also retrieved from the XML. So. Um, yeah, and then you have file, media file, and then new file of the file name from the XML and the contents, right? So, what can we do with this? Of course, uh, first, the XML file is retrieved over TXX SDP. This means any average man in the middle can change that, okay? So that's easy then the attacker hosts the XML file to receive a human rights violations reports forever. So uh, this app was for reporting human rights violations and you could change the configuration of the app so that it will no longer send the reports uh, to the legitimate server, but to an attacker controlled one. Okay, so this was this one was actually quite serious. So, um, yeah, and it actually was on a, a library that the app was using. We had to do like a little bit of of research here about what kind of format this XML file was because we saw the app was requesting this XML, but we didn't know like what format should. Uh, what format should be this XML, right? So in here, um, we have like the file name and then we specify dot dot slash. And then this is basically to navigate outside of the, of the SD card, which is where um, the download was supposed to be saved and save it into the actually actual app preferences. 
So the apps in Android are on data data, then there was uh, some vulnerable app, and then shared preferences, and we can provide the app preferences.xml. So we controlled the exact file name, uh, then the download URL, we can specify any attacker controlled URL, and then uh, in the in the pawn XML, which was the forge preferences, we could specify a server URL to submit the attacker uh, to submit the um, human rights violation reports and attacker control website, right? So we have clear text HTTP, uh, the library downloads an XML file, which has a path traversal on the file name, and this allows us to override the app preferences so we can uh, basically specify that the human right violations reports are going to be sent to a server that the attacker controls, right? So, uh, yeah. So in Lockhead, so one thing you can do when you're testing mobile apps in Android is to check the Lockhead messages. So this is how it looked like, right? So you have MNT SD card path, something, right? And then dot dot slash to navigate outside of the SD card into the app storage. And then uh, it said first that the preferences has been, have been deleted. And then this is when it's copied over. So um, yeah, same path, but the, the file is, is over, overwritten, right? So how to fix this? Uh, validate the file name against a white list of characters. So for example, only allow letters, uh, numbers, and dots, but no slashes or any other uh, special characters. Uh, and then uh, use TLS, which is free now with things like let's, let's encrypt. Then consider pinning to protect from high profile attackers, right? So attackers like uh, most governments and companies. Now, more clear text HTTP for iOS. So, um, what is the vulnerability? Here we have the app request and caches the CSS file from the server. So this on site, mobile app.css, then subsequent requests check for if modified since, so the server always replies with not modified, and then the CSS is added to every article rendered like this, right? So, <clears throat> so it's doing an string, string with format, here we have some HTML, right? Any guesses about what is wrong here and what is the impact? Any guesses? It never reloads the CSS, yes, but uh, there's a problem here, and we want to to do some damage with this. Uh, Felipe, you already got an invite. Give the others a chance, and it's not defacement. Okay, XSS. That's it, XSS. So, Adi, I'm going to add you to the list. Adi, one. Well, so Adi got it right. So we got XSS, correct? So I'm going to explain it now. Let's see. So this is the normal flow, right? Get, uh, get some, uh, try to retrieve some CSS. Well, let me show you in the in the next slide. So, okay, this is the, the actual attack. So. Let me explain it here, and then I'll show the attack. So the file is requested over clear text HTTP. So it means anybody can change it. 
Now the server always replies with mod modified and the CSS is added into every article like this. So here we have with this with these characters here, this means there's a string concatenation. And here we have server provided CSS. And is, this is like concatenated into the HTML, right? So what can we do with this? So the attacker can supply a CSS file uh, with leveraging the clear text uh, man in the middle. So you have some CSS and then here we can like inject arbitrary HTML because in the end this CSS was being loaded in line in the page so we can add any HTML tags even though this would not be correct in CSS it, it didn't matter so we could like close the style and load um, load uh, an arbitrary script right so then the XSS payload what happened is it's going to be executed every time the user reads an article because if we go back before the server always replies with not modified so as long as this file doesn't change you can have man in the middle once like let's say at an airport or whatever and you save the payload of the CSS, right? But then this is going to, you have the exploit with the, X, the XSS exploit inside of the app. And then when the app is checking if the file has been modified, the server is going to say not modified. So even when you no longer have man in the middle, you were still able to execute your, your XSS payload, right? So this was pretty cool. So uh, this was a news app. So what we could do is, uh, for example, uh, load some JavaScript from the, the attacker could load some JavaScript and then get like the user cookies, the, the location of the um, URL that they are reading from the, from the news app, the, the title, the HTML of the page they're seeing, and just, uh, just send it, right? Like just wait one second for the page to load and then send this to the attacker. So this was the uh, a payload like to demonstrate kind of the possible impact of this thing. So it was pretty cool because you had, let's say money in the middle only once, but then you were able to like keep uh, executing your access like as long as, as you wanted. Now, Another thing is permanent XSS uh, logging the user activity. So we can have like what IP address they are connecting from, uh, what is the user agent, the cookies, the URL, and the HTML. So the attacker can like collect all this information from the user as they are using the app. Uh, and another possibility uh, would be to use data exfiltration. So using XSS, uh, if the app has not been hardened very well, you can also uh, download um, arbitrary arbitrary files. So this, what, this is like the payload that we used. Uh, and then there's like some sensitive files array that continues here. So there's what like they're called history, cellular usage, from the phone and then uh, basically you would, we would read like these files and then send them to the attacker. Now this, this one only worked for articles from this news app that were open as favorites because those were open from a file URL. Uh, but it was still pretty cool that in that, in that scenario with the XSS you were, you were able to exfiltrate data. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the rest of the payload, and this is how it looked like. The call history uh, from the phone, you would be able to to read it, right? And then another thing you could do was to um, to exfiltrate data using XSS from uh, from the app itself. So this was the path of the application. Then on iOS, now we saw some attacks like this. 
on Android, in Android, um, the token for the app is known, but on iOS, this is random. So, but the URL, the token was part of the URL, so we were still able to <clears throat> to do a, this quick uh, replace, right? So replace the known parts, and this would give us the token. So with this, we we knew like all the files, like where they should be placed, so we can try to retrieve them and forward them to an attacker. Uh, and this is how it looked like, right? Like got token. And then, yeah, and then it was just able to to forward that. So, uh, how to fix this? Um, avoid usage of peer text HTTP to download files. Consider pinning. Validate the file from the server, like a CSS file should be CSS, should not contain any HTML tags, because that's invalid CSS. Uh, then, if possible, prior to concatenating uh, strings, output and code HTML characters in CSS files before merging with HTML. Uh, avoid loading pages with untrusted input from a file protocol, because this file protocol is like more privileged. Then favor UI text views uh, where possible. Uh, disable JavaScript if possible. Uh, if JavaScript must be enabled, then consider CSP to limit JavaScript uh, as much as possible. And then another thing you can do is sanitize the HTML prior to rendering. And here's a good library to do that. Don't purify. If you're not familiar, it's pretty good as well. Um, so let's continue with data exfiltration attacks. Uh, we have browsing functionality. And here we have uh, browsing functionality, right? So the app has some functionality that expects other apps to send URLs to it and opens those URLs and shows them to the user. So um, an app can be exported, uh, an activity can be exported implicit, implicitly or explicitly. So here we have a browser and then there's an intent filter. So this one is exported implicitly. So this intent filter means that this activity can be invoked uh, by any other app on the, on the phone, right? Now, so this is the first step. We have an exported activity, an activity that can be called by any malicious app on the phone potentially, right? Uh, and what the app does with this is it expects other apps to send URLs to it, and it opens those URLs and shows them to the user because it's a browser kind of app. Now, this is how the intent extra processing is done. So there's a query, and it's saved into the URL. Uh, so what is the vulnerability? For those of you who didn't guess, first, like any of the questions before. So we have an exported activity, uh, some browser app, there's an intent extra, which is a query. And then the final step is we have this URL validation. Do you see a problem with that? Any guesses? In, in this case, there's no money in the middle. This is like, let's say a malicious app sends some uh, URL to this browser app. And then this is how uh, the URL validation is being done. So, any problems with that? Jason, you are already in the list. So, and it's not a malformed URL. Uh, 
Okay, so do you guys think this is like a prop the proper way to validate a, a URL? Okay, so okay, I'm going to jump to the solution. So yeah, we have here, uh, we could talk about all the things like uh, data, JavaScript and stuff, but we also have file, right? Um, file is really cool for data exfiltration because it allows us to read local files, right? In, in specific, um, versions, right? So um, um, depending on the settings. So this is the, the Java code. So we need to send an intent from a malicious app. The URL that we are going to send to the browser is a steel.html file that is going to be run from, so it's a file that is that is saved in a, that is an HTML file that is in the SD card. I'm, it's a 1 a.m. here, so I'm a little bit tired, <laughs> but we're getting there. So, uh, yeah, so there's this HTML file called steel, right? Like a malicious app uh, wrote this file on the SD card. Um, and then what we do is we send an intent to the browser app and we put uh, an extra query to it with a, with a path to the steel file on the SD card, and then we start the activity. So what happens with this? Uh, the browser app is going to open this steel.html file that is in the SD card, right? And then uh, these are the contents, right? So the contents of, of this attack file, and then here you can see um, this is like the location of um, of the app files for this particular app. So we can, using file URLs, we can dump all these local files that the app has, and then uh, so we can load them and then we can forward them to an external to an external site, right? So, so yeah, this was the data exfiltration, and then this is like to prove that we can read files from the phone itself. It would show like this. So yeah. So how to fix this? Do not accept file URLs if possible. Uh, another thing you can do is set allow file access to false. Um, so this disables file system only, it defaults to true, and then set allow file access from file URLs uh, should be set to false, right? It disables file access from file URLs, defaults to false since Android 4.1, but still there's some cases where still people like forget and enable it or something. So uh, yeah, so there's this. Uh, and then uh, set allow universal access from file URLs, uh, set it to false, right? So it disables access to content from any origin from file URLs and defaults to false as well since Android 4.1 as well. So this is the link to that. Now, another scenario, uh, an iOS chat app. So permanent XSS with data exfiltration uh, we have uh, app output encoded uh, incoming messages. The app did not output encode uh, outbound messages. So you could trick a user to self access by copy pasting your message into the chat. So you can, for example, this is a little bit of social engineering, but you could like say, hey, can you copy paste this message into the, the chat? It seems something is not working for me, thank you. And then the, the you, you add this like at the end of the message or something like script source and some URL and then script and then the payload will run like each time the app is open, right? So this was uh, interesting because 
when you sent the message that was escaped properly, but the messages that you sent into your own chat, those were not output encoded. Uh, and then from here, we have like the list of sensitive files and we can just dump them and forward them to, to an attacker as well. Um, yeah, and this is the, how it looked like on the actual form. Then, uh, yeah, how to fix this? Uh, output encode user inputs from all locations, the URL, the chat input sent to others, uh, chat input sent to self, database, and uh, yeah, better be safe than sorry. So just output encode for, from all possible locations and then you should be good. Now, this is actually quite cool, the sexy crypto attacks. So uh, there's a crypto messenger Android app. So does anybody know what the problem is with this? Any guesses? Just a few answers there. So let's see. We have arbitrary file write on decryption, right? So the app receives encrypted files. So the attacker controls this encrypted file, and then when the file is saved, it uh, it makes a new file based on the original file name. So this is the actual problem, right? So let's see uh, what we can do with this. So arbitrary file write on decryption because the attacker was able to specify the original file name and this is being used here in the target file. So this is the, this is the actual problem. So the user A encrypts the message with the original file name like dot dot slash something uh, then user B receives and decrypts this file. And then user A, because of this, can create and overwrite uh, any file in the app storage, right? So we can, we have control over this because, uh, because of, of this here. It's using the original file name that the user provided and using that for the new file, right? So the target file is a new file of the original file name, the original file name that the attacker sent. And there's no validation, nothing. It's just new file of that. So that's the problem. Now, another scenario, PGP email iOS app. Uh, any guesses about what the vulnerability is here? So just for background, right? So there's an iOS app that implements PGP email functionality in JavaScript. So the user input is the received message, right? 
um, um, Ankur, you are correct. So it exposes the private key, yes. So Ankur, let me write it down. Ah. I'm writing it on my phone and it's also correcting. Okay. So, yeah, so this is the vulnerability. So, self message uh, string escape for JavaScript. So, let me see. So, here you have you have this message, self message, string escape for, for JavaScript in the HTML append format, right? So, this is like concatenating basically <clears throat> the is concatenating this into the message, into a message variable, right? So you can send, you could send an email like this, right? Like single quotes, semicolon, then the payload, and then something, and then from this, we would get this JavaScript, right? So the message is a new request and send them to attacker.com, send the passphrase, right? Because the passphrase is, whoops, the passphrase is on on a variable right before the message. So this was how PGP was being implemented in this app. So by sending a, an email like this to a victim, when the app was processing the uh, the, the incoming message, it was concatenating the proof of concept email into the message. So the message is basically uh, here like truncated, right? The message variable is with a single uh, single quote and semicolon. We finish the message, then we have like the XSS payload and then we just finish this. So we have some valid JavaScript and this was sending the passphrase to the attacker. So this was pretty cool attack uh very scary but very cool as well so yeah then the the attacker would have like a netcat listener for example and then you get like um the stolen passphrase would be received by the attacker so how to fix this so let's pretend you must do this with javascript as, as it was done one quick way to do it would be to base 64 encode you say input the entire message before concatenation and then encode you say input in, in javascript right so those would be like two possible ways to go about this now uh, a mandated app in south korea smart sheriff very close to my heart uh, because we had so much fun testing it. So a uh, government mandated app to help parents protect their children, uh, control phone usage, control installed apps, uh, block websites and things like this. Um, so uh, the first thing, right, was it was um, not checking it does like any, it was like making requests over clear text HTTP right in the first time we tested it, right? So round one, no SSL, right? The first time we tested this app, it did not have any SSL. Now, on the second time we tested it, it switched to SSL, but uh, it, it wasn't fixed really well. So this is like the URL. So it looked like, hey, maybe, maybe they fixed it. Uh, but then what happened, right? So this is the code. So the app is using SSL, but this is the, this is the code, right? That is processing. So any guesses about what's wrong with that? Yeah, that is that is correct. It will always proceed with the SSL error. 
but Vitesh, you were already in the list. So, yeah, so you are right. So basically, uh, there's, there's two functions that you can normally overwrite in Android, right? So on received SSL error. So here we have on received SSL error. And then whenever there's any error, you are supposed to perform some validation here, but here there's no validation at all. It's just going to proceed. So whenever there is an SSL error, the app is going to proceed regardless of what the error is, because there's no more validation than this. It was just proceed. So anytime there's a connection and there's some SSL error, just proceed. No, no questions asked, no logic, nothing. Just proceed. And same for host and verifier. It just has return true. So there's no, there's no verification of the host, right? If, if the certificate you got is for a, a host that matches, there's no checks like that. It's always going to return true. So in practice, this meant a uh, SSL man in the middle without warnings on, on an app mandated uh, in an entire country, right? So another thing, this is a crypto one. Uh, what is the vulnerability? So we have uh, imp uh, input is this, this is the output. Now this is the input, this is the output. And then we have encrypt the crypt. So this is how the app is encrypted things. Does anybody see a problem with that? Well, the detecting the algorithm would not be a problem in itself, right? The problem is it's not in the algorithm itself, it's on something that you can see here in this function that is, is not quite right. Like the algorithm in cryptography, they always tell you the algorithm should be public, right? So that people can review it and make sure it's safe. But the issue, I think I gave you enough time. The issue here is uh, that the key to encrypt and decrypt is actually hard coded in the app. So these variables here, like uh, var 109, 111, all these, all these are each of the bytes of the key. So the key for to encrypt and decrypt is hard coded in the app, so anybody can reverse the app and see the key, right? So that's the problem. It's not uh, the actual algorithm being used in, in this case. It's more it's more about the, the the key to encrypt and decrypt being hard coded in the app. So that's the worst, right? Uh, so yeah, so the key is uh, hard coded and it's just doing an XOR, and this explains why the input and output are the same. You can see here the input is this, the output is this, and then uh, if the if you use the output and then you run it through this, it will give you the input before as well. So, uh, so yeah, if uh, XOR is cool because you can use it to encrypt and decrypt without having to write uh, a different function. So with this. We use in Python wrote some uh, XOR proof of concept, uh, which would allow us to encrypt and decrypt phone numbers, which is what this was being used for. Um, yeah, this is the end of the script. So basically, uh, this was what the key standard for. So Moiva was the company uh, building this up. So 
it was running, it was using this key, and then you have some encrypted stuff run through this extra with the hard-coded key, and it will give you the phone number. So this is the actual uh, look of, of the key. And it's interesting because they added uh, null byte characters here. Uh, maybe so that if you run like the strings command on the binary or something, you would not get the key. I'm not really sure. Maybe that's why. So <clears throat> another one here about crypto. Does anybody see a problem with this? No guesses? It's using a yes, which is good. But how is it using a yes? No guesses? With Cypher, no, the Cypher is good, it's AES. Hardcoded key, okay, and John, I didn't have you on the list, so you will also get one. Yeah, so I have to. I have to see the phone. Yeah, it's. It, I. I went. I'm a bit slow because it's. It's late for me. It's one a.m. here. So uh, yeah, I, I think this is being recorded. So hopefully, yeah. Thanks for joining, Felita. Uh, yeah. So uh, John is correct. Uh, the problem here is is that there's a hard coded key. So we know this because it's doing this base64 decode of some static string here, uh, and then this is getting the bytes from the string and just doing the AES, the the AES running AES through that. So AES is good, but if the key is hard coded, then anybody can get the key and can. Uh, encrypt and decrypt. So this was the second time that we tested it. They added this useless uh, AES encryption layer where you would have like the request. Uh, first they did the, the XOR uh, and then they added this AES thing on top. So there was like another another useless key just uh, run through this AES and this would like encrypt the request just to make it a bit more obscure. So just to summarize this uh, Smart Sheriff app that was uh, mandated in South Korea, you have the request. So you have the phone number of the of the user. If this is run through XOR, which results in a string like this, then it's run through AES, which makes the request look like this, some base64 encoded encrypted stuff. So this is the request going through fail SSL because we saw all the SSL errors are being ignored. And then this is the, the actual uh, response from the server. So it was it was so broken in so many levels because this XOR layer had a hard-coded key. This AES layer had another hard-coded key. Then SSL was not being validated correctly. So this is like all like the broken kind of solution they have is, is uh, really funny. So validate the cell certificates properly, consider pinning, avoid hard-coded uh, encryption keys in apps, uh, request a key over a secure connection to the server, uh, generate a key on the client and send it securely to the server, 
uh, save the encryption key for the user uh, safely leveraging the Android key store, right? So I mentioned this earlier in the talk, like to store secrets on Android, you should use the Android key store, right? Like that's the store is designed for this kind of uh, safe thing. So now uh, let's finish with some uh, remote command execution. So we have a CRM app with Google Auth. So <clears throat> there's a pop-up if the user is not logged in. The user is prompted to log into Google. And then the pop-up closes and sends data uh, to the app out after authentication. So this is quite common. So you have an app and then you have to log in. So this is going to prompt you to log into Google uh, from a pop-up and then the pop-up closes and sends data to the app after all, right? So this is, uh, these are the relevant uh, snippets from the app to find the vulnerability. Does anybody uh, oh, does anybody see what the problem is here? Yeah, so Frankie is correct. We have SQL injection. Uh, so yeah, that that is that is correct. So let me show you. Oops. So we have here update credentials set column uh, equals of value, right? So yeah, we have. SQL injection with remote code execution because uh, normally on Android, when you use a SQL Cypher, because of the way SQL Cypher works, it needs to enable SQLite uh, extensions. And then you can load, if you have SQL injection, you can load a binary as well. So this is a SQL injection turns remote command execution. So we have here, uh, we create a bad binary as a proof of concept. So we go to another app and we save like some garbage data into test.so file. So this would be like a, a library. Now we uh, give permissions so that any app can actually uh, read this. So chmode777. So any app can read this, even though it's in the private storage of the app. And then we just send an intent. Uh, this is the vulnerable app, there's login web view, and then in the URL data, we would say vulnerable app, and then this is data uh, where, like basically doing all the SQLite stuff. And then this is the interesting part, uh, select load extension, from a uh, data data, just trust me, that you saw here above. And this is going to load the um, and test. And then the SO is added by SQLite. And then this would load like the binary from the other app and run it, right? So run it with the permissions of the, the target app, right? The victim app. So here we have uh, in Lockhead, we can see uh, SQL, SQL Cypher, database SQLite exception, uh, DL open failed, has bad elf magic. Uh, and here you can see like the, the injected query, right? Like um, update credentials, set uh, authentication key and all this. So, so yeah, uh, this is how it looked like. Uh, now, this is also interesting because this same attack could not only be done from a malicious app installed on the phone, but it was also possible to do it from a malicious website that the user might be uh, browsing through, right? So let's say they go to an attacker uh, domain and then this uh, attacker uh, 
stage has like this PHP, right? So we have uh, content disposition attachment, and then this is the, the same library that we want to uh, load. And then we add some, sometimes the 40 times the letter A, just to make it uh, throw an error, right? And then this is the second file. So this is, has the SQL, um, the SQL injection uh, payload. And then here we have the iframe. Uh, the first iframe is loading a.php, a which was the file, uh, this file, a.php, that is loading the ace. So this is the, the page of the attacker. So it makes a request to the attacker itself to download the binary. And then five seconds after, hopefully enough time to download the, the binary, then it sends the, the actual intent from the app, right? So this is what, uh, this is the, the payload. And then here is like the URL handler vulnerable app data. And then this was the actual payload with the SQL injection. And, uh, and yeah, that's, and then you can see like in Lockout, like it has bad elf magic because it, it tried to run it. So DL open failed. So it's trying to load uh, arbitrary extensions controlled by the attacker. Uh, so this was pretty cool because you could not only do it from a malicious app, but also uh, from the website, from a malicious website as well. Now, uh, API attacks. So retrieving files from the server. Any guesses about what's wrong with this? Because of course, when you test mobile apps, it's not just the mobile app, it's also the server. So here we have a little bit of server code. Path traversal, yes. This is a path traversal. Okay, that'll be, that'll be good, but there's a bit more than a path traversal, but yes. So we have path traversal and a filter by path, right? So you can see here, and this is what I hinted about before, that this is trying to replace dot dot slash sequences and this looks like it's removing the, the dot dot slash, but uh, it actually doesn't work. I'll show you. I'll show you why in a second. And then it's reading the file, right? So it seems like it's removing the dot dot slash sequences, and then the files would be safe, but they are not because you can replace dot dot slash with nothing, but that leaves dot 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 slash slash, so this will become dot dot slash afterwards, right? So all these like sequences will become the, the short sequence. So you have input like this, and then when dot dot slash is removed, then you end up with dot dot slash, right? So you need to provide something that ends in dot dot slash, and then you're, you are good to go. So, so yeah. And this was the path traversal on the on the API server. So uh, use a function that only returns the file name of the path. Uh, verify that the URL starts and finishes with the expected uh, directory and stuff. So yeah, validate the the thing starts start uh, start and finish how they should. Reject dot dot sequences. Uh, and that's it. And then uploading files to the server, always interesting functionality. So any guesses about what's wrong here? Okay, so here 
we have it creates directories, yes, but the vulnerability is is worse than creating directories on the server. Here we have some this is Python code, and here we have uh, the PGP fingerprint, and then so this is the user files, and then it runs a command making directories. But then the way run command is defined is here, which is basically doing a join of the command. So here we have a dictionary, which is uh, normally should be safe in Python, but when you do a join of the list, then you are basically concatenating everything into a string, and then this is this is the this is using the shell equals true uh, option, which means you can basically run anything you want uh, from Python, right? Like normally from Python you would run commands more in a format like this, and not like in a single string. You would give you would give a list. That is the proper way to do it. So then. <clears throat> Here we have a remote code execution in file uh, user upload. This is the PGP fingerprint. Um, is where the vulnerability was, and then there's some value here, so we can like add a pipe and then wget uh, of the server, who am I, and that's it, right? So this would be like how the proof of concept looks like but this would be remote code execution uh, in the file upload, just because of this uh, string concatenation. So you would have uh, an ethical listener, and then there's some file, and then this is uh, a reversal one-liner. There's uh, many examples of this uh, on the internet. So <clears throat> one way to do this could be with curl, just the site and then send the PGP fingerprint and then add a pipe to wget of uh, the attacker file and then and then just just run that. And with that, we go, we go like a connection back and then we were already root. So this was also uh, pretty good. Uh, yeah, so if possible, avoid string concatenations, like the how to fix this. Uh, try to use uh, suppressors the open with shell equals false. And then if you must concatenate strings uh, in PHP and other platforms, there's some um, options to, to use scaping, like scalp shell arg in uh, PHP. And then validate user input with a white list that is as restrictive as possible. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, this would be API, uh, API leaks. So I'm going to move over this. So just a funny thing that we found on, on the Smart Sheriff app uh, that was mandated in South Korea was the bully API. So basically, like this bad child that wants to mess up with the other kids in the class, right? So. Uh, just knowing the the phone number of one of the other children, right? Like you would ask, like Smart Sheriff, the Smart Sheriff API, hey, I really want to mess with this kid, and then Smart Sheriff said, okay, sure. If you give me that phone number, this is the parent phone number, and with that, you can already do a lot of damage because having the parent phone number for any other kid in the class, um, you can already, uh, you know, like put the kid in trouble. But for the bully kid, they really want to mess more, right? So the phone number is kind of the login, but but still the password would be cool, right? So then it will ask like, hey, can you give me uh, the password as well so I can log in? And then Smart Sheriff, of course, would give you the password uh, XOR encoded uh, so you could like getting the key from the from the app as we saw before. Uh, you can basically log in as the parent of any of the children um, in the class, right? So this was really bad because the app was mandated in the entire country. Every child on the country in South Korea uh, had to use this app. So in any class, just by knowing the phone number of any of the other kids, you would be able to, um, to get access 
to the parent interface to control that phone and say, hey, this child cannot use uh, the phone anymore and all this kind of stuff, right? So this is how it looked like in practice. So you have a uh, curl command sending a message request. <clears throat> and this is what the request looked like with the uh, mobile phone number of the child uh, with the XOR stuff. And then this would give you back the parent phone number. So this was the parent phone number with the XOR stuff and the password with the XOR stuff. So just on doing the XOR, you can see here the phone number and the password of the of the parent. So this was really about this uh, universal password leak. <clears throat> so by knowing the phone number of any child, you would get the parent phone number and the PIN of the parent to login on the website. And from there, you would access a lot of statistics about the child and stuff. So this is really bad. Then, <clears throat> then yeah, because there's so many users, you could try many at random, many phone numbers at random and get all the parents. So you could get access to arbitrary uh, parents in the in the country, just uh, yeah, trying phone numbers at random. And then another app like this was Smart Dream in South Korea, uh, which would monitor uh, messages for harmful words. Let's say like if the child is talking about uh, like sex menstruation or something like this, if there were some words like this in the message, then it would. Uh, save this message and alert the parents, right? So that's the idea. Um, yeah, I have a demo about this, but <clears throat> I don't have it ready now with the screen sharing, or let me see, was there many people left? Because I went way over, let me see if I can share that. So we'll, we'll just keep the demo. There's a, a recording in in Alaska about it. Or if you go to the <clears throat> to the website in 7 securitycom you will you can see this in the in the blog as well. Now, uh, oh, here, okay. So yeah, so you would implement access control. So basically, the demo is that we could dump like all the messages from the from the API, right? So you could dump all these messages that the children were writing about and stuff, which is really bad. So <clears throat> the solution to this, implement access control, limit access to data based on user permissions, centralize security controls as much as you can, limit database queries based on who the user is, uh, do this in a centralized way, like in an, a, a, an active record implementation. If you could do it at that level, that would be perfect. Um, and then automatically add data is query clauses that filter data is queries based on who the user is. And that's the end of the presentation. If you made it until here, thank you very much. Uh, normally I speak a lot faster, but uh, I'm a bit tired because it's kind of late here. It's uh, half past uh, 1 a.m. for me. So and I'm more of a morning person, so I'm a little bit uh, tired, but I hope uh, you like this. Um, if you were one of the ones who guessed the question, let me know, and I'll check this with the list. Just send me uh, an email, and I'll send you an invite. Sounds good? Perfect. Any other? Yeah, if, uh, if there are any other questions, maybe I will laugh a little. Thank you, Abraham. Greatly appreciate you um, and this talk. Right before everyone goes and this ends, um, I dropped two links in the chat. One of them is the next OWASP in-person meeting, which would be on February 6th. So there's a link to our meetup. And also you can join us on Discord if you want to communicate and talk with us. Um, so we have a Discord channel. Uh, but yeah, so that's it. I dropped my email in there also if you want to communicate with us. Thank you for coming. Um, we'll be posting the recording also on the chat for other people who's, who's been, who's missed it on, on the meetup. So 
Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.